Canada has the expertise and potential to be a global green economic leader, but has yet to make the most of its growing clean technology industry. So says our next guest. She is Céline Back. She is president at Analytica Advisors, and it's nice to have you here on TVO tonight. To Let me share. Boy, can I just show this to the camera before we start? How about over here? This is, I mean, that's a, that is one honking study that you have done here. That is, how many, I mean, it's 500 pages almost. The 2014 Canadian Clean Technology Industry Report. And we're not going to be able to do too many highlights from this report, but can we just say the following? More than 700 technology companies are represented in this report. The industry revenue was an estimated $11.3 billion. It directly employs 41,000 people. Export revenues you've estimated at $5.8 billion. And 42% of export sales are from non-U.S. markets. So give us, if you would, just to start off our conversation here, give us a picture of the sorts of company that make up this sector. Well, in Canada and in Ontario in particular, we have some fantastic examples of clean technology companies, companies that are investing heavily in R&D, that are taking on global markets, and that are providing really good jobs for Canadians. So it's an industry which has the hallmarks of the future and of prosperity for Canada. Um, some examples, and we have one of the, we have the third largest solar panel manufacturer in the world. Uh, is, it's an Ontario company. Are you allowed so to name names here? Canadian Solar is okay. the company. Um, and it's a, it's a company that has a presence in China, but it is a Canadian company. Its leadership is based in Canada, and it's providing solar power plants uh, to all regions of the planet, manufacturing in Guelph, Ontario. That's hmm. a great story in many different ways. In terms of smaller companies, uh, we have many companies in the storage area because, because Ontario has invested in renewable energy because renewable energy requires storage. We have great companies in all kinds of storage areas, um, and some of them are, are have significant presence in Europe. For example, Hydrogenics is a company that has, uh, has signed some important partnerships and some very important business in Germany, very demanding you know, not just sort of uh, easy markets to be competitive in. And uh, yeah, other companies that are younger, up and coming, are, are in fly storage, flywheel storage, others in underwater uh, storage, a major demonstration project in Lake Ontario. And one can imagine all kinds of opportunities to provide that kind of technology to communities near lakes, whether they're remote communities or communities near oceans in the Caribbean, et cetera. So we have some great stories. It's, a, it's time for Canadians and Ontarians to get to know this wonderful sector. Well, if, let's make some comparisons with the rest of the world here, because the Canadian economy is apparently 2% of the global economy, mm -hmm. and we have 2.6% of the global trade, mm -hmm. but those are overall economic numbers. Yes. How about if we focus just on your sector? How do we compare? Well, this sector at the moment is sitting at about 1% of the global uh, market, which is about a trillion. So 11 billion over 1 trillion is about 1%. Um, as an example, in the aerospace industry, we hold uh, more than 3.5% of the global uh, aerospace industry. So we can p punch above our weights, uh, our weight in, in innovation-based, very globally competitive industries. If we had our fair share of a global of the global market in this, it would be uh, twice the size of the aerospace and industry. And what's preventing that from happening? Well, I think some awareness uh, would be helpful. Um, and I think at any time in an economic transition, uh, it is difficult to have the tools to keep track of things. And so, we do this primary research not because it's particularly easy, it's actually very difficult, um, but because there aren't any other ways of capturing, well, what are the jobs, how many companies, where are they, take the census, what's the R&D, et cetera. I think that if uh, we uh, began uh, to, to consider, well, how do we make this much easily, easy, more easily tracked as an export sector, I think uh, decision making would be easier as an example. Exports uh, make up an important part of your picture. Yes. How come? Well, um, the Canadian economy is a $1.6 trillion economy, and uh, exports are a quarter of that. And um, we, you know, we are living in an age of globalization, and we are losing manufacturing jobs, and um, increasing an increasing share of our exports is the fossil fuel industry. And that is, th that's important to keep all of our sort of economic levers in balance, but there's some risk associated with that. And I think uh, particularly Ontario, we need to think about how we build industries that can represent a $20 million export uh, industry because of the jobs that are associated with that. I hear you when you say that if we had a, a concomitant 
lack of a better word, uh, share of the market. It'd be twice as much as what it is in the rest of the economy. But having said that, the sector is growing. I look at the 2009 numbers, 26%. 2011 numbers, 31%. 2012 numbers, 35%. Our share of the clean tech business in the province of Ontario is growing. Yes, it is. So what are we doing to foster this growth? Well, Ontario um, has quite a, uh, I would call, comprehensive sort of policy package for innovation that I'm sure you've, you've discussed in, in other circumstances. Um, so there is incubation. Um, the average age of companies in Ontario is 13 years old and the average age of companies in the, in the rest of Canada or in, on average is 16, so younger companies in this province. Um, We've invested significantly in demonstration. So companies come here sometimes from other parts of Canada because they can demonstrate their technology in terms of uh, storage and the Green Energy Act. Those are good examples. Um, there, there is obviously you know, an extensive education infrastructure that gives people uh, good training so that they can be really productive employees in these well-paying, low uh, carbon economy jobs. So I think Ontario has, uh, has thought about this uh, sector quite carefully and in Minister Wynne's letter to her minister, letters to her ministers, the sector is named as a priority sector. Well, let me, you mentioned Kathleen Wynne, the Premier. Let me, your report says clean technology is already a calling card for Canada. So do you think the Premier and the Prime Minister have got that calling card in their wallets? Uh, not necessarily both of them. Um, so we have obviously named a number of countries and, and regions as major trade priorities. Uh, Europe, Korea, Japan through the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and others. Um, those countries, all of them, are looking for, to Canada for solutions for the low carbon economy to address environmental issues, et cetera. Um, but we don't necessarily inscribe clean technology as a leading sector when we go to discuss trade matters with those partners. And it's mm -hmm. ironic because they're coming to us through other channels to say, can you help us with these problems? <laughs> and yes, certainly we can, we'd love to. Um, so that's something where I think uh, our trade policy could catch up. Um, I think provincially that, uh, yes, it's certainly a focus area and it continues to be supported by our trade professionals who do a very good job representing Canada, uh, Canada and Ontario around the world. Um, there is one other area that I think where we need to do some uh, awareness raising and that is uh, within the the global climate uh, discussions, there are really two files, one which is the carbon emissions file and the other which is the financing file. And it has already been established that um, the carbon financing or the, the carbon mitigation uh, file is a hundred billion dollar annual figure. Mm -hmm. And that's to be leveraged, obviously, both private and public sector. It is aid, it is not, it, it is for the, the signatures of uh, the protocols. Um, and Canada's share of that would be uh, between, well, the, the global public sector piece would be, be, my opinion, is between 20 and 30 billion and our share of that would be 5%. It's well, a lot of money. Tell, yeah, it sure is. <laughs> but, but tell me this, because the conventional wisdom in this province, and you can tell me whether you think it's wrong. I suspect you do, but anyway. The conventional wisdom is we're all paying too much for our energy these days because we've invested so much in clean tech, and in particular fit programs and this type of thing, and the demonization of this sector, uh, particularly you know, over the last couple of years, has really been very intense. What do you think of all that? Well, it, it, there are sort of two, two pieces to it. One is um, renewable energy projects are not the same thing as clean technology companies. Clean technology companies have intellectual property and they manufacture and commercialize their technology. Mm -hmm. They may also do project development, but most of them you know, do not. Um, so it, you know, various people can, or, or companies can come to Ontario and do renewable energy projects. And in some cases they, they buy, uh, Canadian and Ontario solutions for those projects. Hmm. So I wouldn't conflate the two. Um, I think the- As I just did, you mean. Yes, the Green <laughs> Energy Act okay. had a number of, uh, of, re of remarkable qualities to it. I think one thing that was missing was the community ownership of those projects. I think it would have made a big difference if we had all had a stake in these investments. Um, but I think we would be very much throwing out the baby with the bathwater if we didn't take the benefit of the jobs that these export-oriented companies are now creating. Okay. The introduction to this report mm -hmm. says, we must work to remove any structural barriers to growth. What would you say those are? 
Uh, well, I think awareness is a big is a structural barrier. I think access to debt financing is a structural barrier. Um, equity financing is important, but to have our companies grow from ten deployments to a hundred deployments to a thousand deployments, they will need access to debt. Um, and that debt is not necessarily going to be an easy thing to find in the beginning because debt doesn't take risks. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about how we segment out risk and, and decide who can insure that risk, et cetera. That's across the whole, I mean, if you're talking venture capital as well, that's across the whole economy. Yes, we're, it is. we're not great at that, so. Well, uh, you Depends know, I think some, you know. Pe people are, are considering venture capital. This is a slightly challenging area for venture capital because it's, mm -hmm. um, as they call it, uh, capital intensive. Venture capital prefers capital light uh, types of investments. Mm -hmm. uh, groups such as the World Trade Organization, uh, what are they doing to help to promote, first of all, this industry and the notion of a lower carbon economy as a whole? Well, there's a very interesting initiative occurring right now at the WTO, which is to remove all tariffs from what is referred to as environmental goods. Um, this is a plurilateral initiative, which means that it is not all parties to the WTO, but I think of note is the fact that China is uh, at the table for this plurilateral process. Um, now, again, to get back to these structural issues, we don't actually necessarily have an agreed to list of all of the tariffs that are applicable to this industry, which in, uh, at the WTO in, in trade-related matters is referred to as environmental goods. So we need to look at that. Something tells me, though, that um, something tells me that the, the oil and gas people would hire the best lawyers and lobbyists in the world to get out there and say, "Hey, we're environmental. We deserve to have these tariffs lowered on our stuff as well." You know, I don't know if there are tariffs <laughs> on oil and gas. I suspect not, but um, but I, I they may. No, I mean they go idea. for the they go for the yeah. for the subsidy and the deal if if they could get it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the industries of the past will always be well positioned to argue mm -hmm. for the opportunity for them moving forward, and I think Canada is a vibrant, growing a growing economy which can make a transition with the industries of the past becoming increasingly competitive and increasingly efficient, whether it's the forestry industry, the mining industry, the oil and gas industry, these are companies that operate in those industries as enablers, and so there's there's actually no need for them to be in opposition. I think that uh, one can have better growth and better climate, um, uh, you know, with the same uh, with the same companies operating uh, in sort of in a more um, symbiotic way. Sure, but we've heard another guest on the program say that the difference between the subsidies offered to fossil fuels based industries and clean industries, green in industries, is, is it by a factor of six to one. It, it so is, if you could get a piece of that action, you guys would be laughing, wouldn't you? Yes, um, and there are certainly, you know, a price on carbon would be very good mm -hmm. uh, for, for all companies and that are working in realms that provide low carbon solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So it is an opportunity. Here's another excerpt from your report. Over the last 20 years, we have held and then lost leads in biotechnology, cable and satellite technology, Clean technology requires both the private and public sector to embrace the urgency that is required to avoid being left behind in the global race again. Now you sit on a committee, I gather, for the Asia Development Bank. What lessons do you think Canada could learn from what you're hearing from what's transpired in Asia on all of this? Well, I, I think in Asia, it, you know, the, the, they're, they take a whole of government approach um, and policies are not siloed. So when China produces a policy on carbon, there is an innovation piece, there's a regulatory piece, there's a financing piece. It, it just is very comprehensive um, and it will be connected to the climate policy and to the, um, uh, to the energy policy and also to aid. Um, so I think it's the, the challenge is for us to have the same urgency to break down those silos as uh, the Asian economies have. And I would include in that actually Japan. I mean, Japan has never had this sort of artificial idea that what is climate finance is aid, and therefore, you know, we really are not going to suggest that Japan has some of the world's best solutions for climate mitigation. I mean, they're proud of their solutions. We don't yet have that pride. Well, and this will be a vast generalization here, so uh, let me just state that up front. But, but those countries, you tend to think of the Republic of Korea, Japan, I mean, they're all in on some of this stuff, right? The government and business work hand in glove together to make their national priorities happen. Do you see that here? 
Well, uh, you know, we, we don't have that traditional state-owned right. enterprise uh, industrial structure here. Um, there are certainly people uh, in the Ontario government who are familiar with the industrial capacity that we have. Um, but I would say at the federal level, we, we don't have yet that level of coordination. There's an opportunity for us to, to be more engaged and to have greater coordination between some of those policy platforms. But we're not likely to take that. That's not, we don't have a history of that, right? In, in, a, in the same way that other countries elsewhere in the world do. We, that, that notion of government and business uh, you know, almost being at the table together to, to collaborate. Do you see that? Well, actually, the, there's a thing called the new, new trade, and the new, new trade is all about knowing about corporate capacity and markets that they should be involved in. So, yes, there is an, there's an interest in that. I think it's obviously they're not going to be state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. but the, the notion that government would be more aware of what corporations, big and small, would be looking for in terms of markets, uh, I think you'll, see, you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks and months. Uh, not to get too partisan here, but it, it's a conservative government federally. They have a natural yeah. suspicion of government sticking its business, you know, its nose too much in private sector business. So yes. do but you think any of this can of, happen? We've spent a lot of time talking about pipelines, which in my I understood was a private <laughs> sector endeavor. So I guess I, I think that this government is open to this. Uh, I, you know, there are some, some ministers, uh, junior ministers among them that are considering this matter. Um, and so I have... I have faith that evidence will prevail. You have faith that evidence will prevail? I do. How many of these companies are in Alberta? Maybe that's the question you uh, should be asking. About 150, actually. 150 out of how many? Out of 700. Uh, okay. Well, so that's they, a, no, we, that's we actually, the, the uh, rate of incubation of companies is almost in, entirely consistent with GDP. Huh, okay. Yeah. Let me ask you why. We've got about a minute and a half to go. Let me ask you one other thing. We've got your report here. We're also talking on the program tonight about the new climate economy report. Mm. We're seeing uh, a lot more interest and, and you know, companies, governments adopting a low carbon economy and the notion that this is not going to cost us job, but actually that there are job creation opportunities here. You know, on many things, the public's ahead of the politicians on these things, right? Is that the case here? Uh, I think that the public is going to be uh, engaging in a, in a more direct conversation with their elected uh, representatives. To yes. demand what? Well, to demand that, 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 that we don't make uh, the argument as being a false choice. Uh, I think that it's a case of, of you know, learning about what Canada's capacity is. This industry has grown up uh, completely under the radar with nobody knowing about it. And if someone paid a little bit more attention to it, it would grow much more quickly. And I think Canadians are going to start asking questions about that uh, to their uh, elected officials. You know, governments set up, when they see some shiny new thing over there, they'll set up a new ministry of whatever. You know, the Ontario government did it 10 years ago with a new ministry of research and innovation. Did, you know, do you need something like that in order to be the kinds of players you want to be? It's a good question. I think that the, the, uh, the, the question of how to have institutional capacity for a transition in the economy is a vital one, and I think civil society needs to think about that and to consider if we need some sort of institutional capacity because there are policy entrepreneurs, good people working in the public sector, whether federally or provincially, who are trying to do the right thing and looking for evidence to make sound decisions, but they don't necessarily know who each of them are hmm. and they don't necessarily have consultation vehicles to make it easier. They'll know who they are in this. 500 pages of it. Right. <laughs> evidence right there. Celine, thanks a lot for coming into TVO tonight. I appreciate meeting you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.